And so in this part of the presentation we're going to look at some hashing methods, especially around MD5 and SHA, and look at some of the problems that uh, we see within them. Okay, so uh, so let's make a start. So we're going to initially look at some uh, basic hash types. So really hashing uh, gets around the problem of how do we fingerprint our data. So we can have lots of data or a little bit of data, we can have files and so on. So we want to set up some method that allows us to be able to take a, a little fingerprint of uh, our data and to make sure that we know if the data has been changed or, or not. So this is really solved by Ron who created the standard uh, MD5 uh, hashing method. Okay, so this is an example of uh, our hashing method. For this we have a 128-bit uh, signature for uh, MD5. So we take our text and then we are able to convert it into some hexadecimal or some base 64 format to be able to uh, produce our fingerprint for the data. So for hexadecimal, uh, we end up with something that looks a bit like this. And we'll see no matter the length of the data, we always end up with the same uh, MD5 signature. Because this is 128 bits, we actually find we have 32 of these characters because each one is 4 bits long. So we have 32 bits, 32 characters, hexadecimal characters, representing our, our hash value. We can see if we change even one character in the signature, such as between the H here and the capital H, it completely changes the hash signature that we have here. We can have different lengths of these signatures, and this is a 160-bit signature. The longer the length, the more secure it actually is, and the more reputable it is. So in this case, we have hello, and we're converted it into a 160-bit signature. And let's have a look at our an example here. So we should always get the same hash value. We'll see that we use salt a little bit later on to be able to change it. But if we take hello, then there you go. There's the the hash signature that we have for hello. And it's the same as the one that we have here. Then we can get 256, 318, 512 and so on. And the way it works is that we just have to change one little bit of the data, say from an O to an A here, and it will completely change the hash signature that we actually get uh, for the, the data. So we can use uh, packages such as OpenSSL or MDSUM to be able to have a look at our hash signatures. So let's actually go on to our Linux Kali machine and see if we can get the it to work. So you power on, just open up the console. Okay, so what you normally do is that uh, you say echo Minus N means no line feeds after the text. And then sometimes it might be a little bit difficult to get uh, to get some of your characters to be working in Kali. So what I'll do is I'll just copy and paste the pipe to that. And open SSL for MD5. Okay, so there we go there. And we can also do the same with uh, MD sum, MD5 sum, because it's the same value here. So open SSL will support many different methods. So if you want to do it on Windows too, so you should find that it, that it works in Windows. So open SSL supports MD4, MD5, and then SHA1, and so on. And normally what we do is that uh, we'll, we'll take our, our fingerprint of uh, our files and then we know if the if the, we get a different MD5 uh, signature 
then we know that the file has actually changed. So many systems uh, actually identify a certain file uh, based on the signature that it actually produces. We also see another things like in digital certificates. We have a thumbprint. The thumbprint itself is in is a in this case a SHA one signature, and this is the value that identifies the the actual thumbprint for for the signature. If the system reads the digital certificate uh, and this and it produces a different thumbprint, then the the software knows that the certificate has been changed in some way. And we'll see it also in terms of storing passwords. So in Windows we have an NT hash password which is hashed into the registry. And we also see in things like Cisco routers where the pass the password is hashed uh, onto the into the configuration. The way that an intruder can will crack uh, an uh, a hashed value is that they can run what's called the dictionary attack where the intruder will convert from a standard dictionary of words into a hash value they then compare these the values on the output with the one they're looking for and then they're able to match them up so in this way they don't actually reverse the hash back but what they do is they, they create the hash values for equivalent words we can also get what's called a rainbow table with a rainbow table the hash values are already pre-prepared and then all the intruder has to do is to search through all those values and then find the match without actually having to convert words into the hash value so this happened with the uh, with the Adobe hack where the 150 million accounts were compromised you can see in this case the most popular password was 123456 used by nearly 2 million people and it was fairly simple to be able to reverse back the hash to the original plain text as so many users used that Okay, so there are lots of other uh, hash methods that uh, are actually used in, in practical implementations. As we've seen, the LM hash is used in Windows. SHA-3 is a, is a new hashing method that's been created uh, in 2012 uh, and standardized by, by NIST. And it uses a new way of actually computing the, the hash signature. We have bcrypt, which uh, has salting integrated into it. Uh, then we have uh, this RIP AMD, which is used within TrueCrypt, and we'll see that a little bit later on in the um, on the course. And then Tiger. So you should find that the the main methods are actually defined on uh, this page here with our hashing methods. If you want to look at any any of these, so there's LM hash here. And we've also got SHA-3 in there too. This is the new method of creating a hash signature. Then there's two next such as this, which is PBKDF2. And with this, uh, it's used in TrueCrypt. We have a password and some salt, as we'll see, and it creates a, a key. The key is then used to be able to open up a header file that contains the encryption keys for uh, our disk encryption. So a key concept that we have with inside hashing is to be able to salt the the uh, the signature that, that we produce. So as we've seen, uh, the problem with uh, with hashing is that it's possible to actually uh, create a rainbow table or a dictionary attack and actually find out the hash value which relates to a certain uh, data value. With salt, what we do is that we we add a little bit of extra into the the uh, process of producing our hash to make sure that we can produce many different uh, hashed values. 
Okay, so here's an example here. Uh, what we have is that when we store a password, uh, we store it in the form such as this, uh, delimited by the, the dollar signs there. So the first element actually tells us that what we've got is MD5. The second element actually defines the salt that we're going to use. And then the third actually uh, defines the hashed value, including the salt. So with this, what happens is that we have our password, in this case, password. We then take the salt and then we create the MD5 uh, signature based on the salt and also for the ha for the pass for the password. So in this case, uh, we're taking Fred as our salt. We're taking a password and it produces this hashed value here. And then when we store it, we store it along with the salt and also with the algorithm that we've actually used. Okay, so this is the way that uh, we would uh, we would actually store uh, our passwords on uh, on uh, our system. Okay, so this shows an example here, and this shows a, a Linux uh, password file uh, stored in the the shadow uh, file, and we can see here this is how it's stored. One defines that we're using MD5. This here is the salt, and then this here is the hashed value with the salt. So the way that we actually check the uh, that the password is correct that's been entered is that we take the salt, we take the user's password, and then in this case this is uh, MD5, and then we run it through say OpenSSL, and it actually produces if it produces the same value here for the hash value then we actually know that, uh, that the user has entered the, the correct password so in this case red hat with the salt gives us this hash value which is the same as this value here okay so so this allows us to be able to uh, salt our, our passwords so let's actually have a look at this in action Okay, so this is a uh, our password generator. Okay, so we have a user called Bill and a password here, and there's Mike, and his password is password one two three. There is a method called APR, which is another method of uh, of creating these hash values, and this is how the password would actually be stored. So APR here, one APR one actually defines the hashing method. This part here defines the salt and then this is the resultant uh, hashed value for the for the password. Okay so that that allows us to be able to uh, work out whether someone's password is actually correct. So if we actually try this one out here. So what we want we'll just try this one on our Kali machine. So open SSL password minus one minus salt and then it's F T G two E X U Z Red Hat mm, just check that. Ah sorry it's an E is the first one for the salt. So it's E T G two E X U Z and there we go okay so that has produced the same uh, value here as we can see over over there okay so so when we store our salted uh, our salted hash signature 
we store the salt along with it and that will allow us to be able to generate the same hash value for the same password that's been actually entered. Okay, so uh, we can have a we often in a Linux system store these passwords with inside a, a shadow password file. That's what that file has shown there. Okay. So now let's look at another important area with inside our our hash signatures and that's to do with collisions. So a collision happens when we actually have different data and that different data produces the same uh, hash hash signature. So it can be uh, just a, a normal uh, collision attack where we have different data sets that will actually create the same hash value. But it is also possible to have a similar context where the message itself is similar in its in its basic context and uh, and also with our full context so we've shown that uh, md5 can produce a collision with inside of less than a minute so that's produced the same hash value for different for different data and sha1 has also been seen uh, theoretically to produce a, a collision and the best time in 2006 was actually 18 hours for that so this shows an example of a, of a hash uh, collision. So we can see here there are only a few different things in the data that have been changed but when it's run through MD5 it produces the same uh, hashed value. So in this way uh, the the hash hashing method has been compromised just by flipping a few bits. Uh, they have not been reflected through on the output so if we actually have a look there you should find when you look at uh, the md5 page then look at that so if you try down here you actually find here's the two data sets and so with this data we'll produce uh, this Hash signature, and then if you try the other data input data, then it'll actually produce the same hashed value. So this creates uh, a collision where we've actually created the same hash value for different data. So, so we've seen how Linux and many systems actually create their hash values with salting and so on. Let's have a look at how Windows actually produces its hashed values. Okay, so just as a quick overview, uh, every user within a Windows domain actually has a unique uh, identifier called an SID. And at the end of the SID, there's actually a, a number which actually defines their, their role. The passwords themselves are actually either stored on the domain controller if, if someone connects to a to a, a domain, so that's typical in a, in a corporate type network. So that's stored in the in the domain controller. But on a on a normal uh, standalone machine, it is stored with inside the SAM database uh, in the registry here. So here we see the the registry, and this is this is what actually stores the uh, stores the the username and passwords. Okay, so there are different methods in Windows XP 2003. They're stored as LM hashes, but uh, they're stored as NTLM uh, hashes uh, without any salt for Windows 7 and Windows 8. If someone connects to a domain, then it uses uh, NTLM version 2. Okay, the actual file itself is stored on the disk in the Windows System 32 config folder and there we are there that's the SAM 
so that stores the um, the usernames and passwords so it's not possible to get access to that because on a running system but it is possible by examining the disk uh, when it's not actually booted so there are various uh, packages that allow the export of the, uh, the SAM file into what's called a, a, a pwdump file and a pwdump file uh, looks a bit like this here so it actually has the username and then this role ID and there is the lm hash and there is the ntlm hash so in this way uh, it is it is possible to to find out the hash values of the of the usernames and passwords so the first uh, set here defines the lm hash and you'll actually see that for characters less than seven or so then we actually get the same end part to the hash this one here shows the ntlm hash that we get that's now used in windows 7 and windows 8 so there are various packages which can actually break this this type of uh, hash or determinant and uh, john the the ripper is is one so in this case we're taking a a, a pw dump here and then and actually having a look at the hash values and you can see that it's cracked for the user Napier that their password is, is, is Napier okay so we can have a look at that on our system so let's bring up Kali let's have a look to see what's in there okay so we can see that we've got two uh, passwords in there and what we can do is then just run John the Ripper so on, on Kali what we can do is bring up either our package from, from here there or we can just run it from the, the command line ok so that's PW Okay, so it's already done those ones. Okay, so we can see here that it's managed to to crack two of the of the hash signatures there, password and and Napier. And the other package that uh, that is often used is Ofrecrack and with this it's a graphical user interface uh, package so again we'll bring up this one here and this time we'll actually run it from here okay so we'll load up our file here that we had and we'll give it a try there we go so it's found password and it's found Napier okay we can also load up some rainbow tables uh, if we need to in terms of that so then we would go here and then we'd actually load up our rainbow table and install a, a new one so you can install the rainbow table one there and that gives you the the rainbow tables for our OF crack okay another technique that we have is what's called message authentication codes so with this what we have is rather than to just produce a hash we have a secret key on the other side and then that is used to create what's called an HMAC which is a mes message authentication code so typically what we do is that we might negotiate a secret key together and then uh, we take the message create an HMAC for it 
and then the other side does the same, takes its key, produces an HMAC, and then we can actually compare the two HMACs together, and only if we have the same secret key can we actually produce the, the same uh, uh, hash signature. Another method that we have is what's called one-time passwords. So with this we can have uh, a, just a basic one-time password where we ha uh, create a, some sort of hash first time and then the second time we'll take the hash again and then we'll put it through the algorithm to produce a new one. So only by knowing the original seed can we actually de determine the password at any given time. We can also have a timed password where the, the hash value produced, or the password produced, is only valid for a certain amount of time. And then we can have a counter, so for every single time that we uh, we access the system, uh, it will produce a, d a different uh, value for us. So we can actually have a look at that here. So we'll have a look at our different types of, of one-time password. Okay, so here's a one-time password. So we'll, we'll start off with, we start off normally with a certain seed value. And then from there, you can see every time we generate a new one-time password, it changes the, uh, the password that we see here. Only by knowing the original seed can we actually generate the, the new ones. The other method that we have is a timed one-time password. And this is used often, uh, say, for accessing secure services on online. So we would normally have some sort of seed here. And then from there, we can only generate a password every five seconds. So you see I'm clicking that. It doesn't generate a new one until we get to five seconds. And then it will generate a new one from there. So that's a, a timed password, five seconds, and then we can also have a hashed one-time password where we can have a, a certain, we start off with a certain seed, and then each time we count, we'll get a different one-time password. Okay, so the, the value that we produced depends on the count that's actually required. Okay, the last little concept is FMV and Murmur. I won't go into the, them in any great detail, but Murmur and FMV are, are, are hashing codes that don't actually involve cryptography, so they can be used on fairly simple types of devices. The very last technique is what's called Shamir's secret sharing. And with Shamir's secret sharing, we have a secret, such as, say, the equation of the straight line here. And we can actually share the secret by having two points on the line. And only by knowing these two points can you actually determine what the secret is. So in this case, Shamir allows you to be able to take some data and to split it into uh, these shares. And then you can actually define how many of the shares need to come together to produce the original data. So this is a two from three share, where two of the shares that have been created can come together, any two, and actually produce the data back again. Okay, so you should find there's a there's a sample of uh, this Shamir within our cryptography section. And here we are here. Okay, so if we take some data, hello, and we see that we've got five shares, and any three of the shares can be can rebuild the data. Then we end up with a whole lot of these hashed B64 values. If you bring three of them, any three together, it rebuilds the message back again. Okay, so this has uh, given us a an introduction to hashing and how we actually use it. Thank you.